Are you an aspiring creative in entertainment, business, fashion, design, or the arts? Do you want to elevate your creative passion project to the next level? Then this show is for you. Whether you want a career in television, film, radio, literature, music, or beyond, Creative Breakthrough will show you how to take your dreams and turn them into reality. This show will not only leave you feeling motivated and inspired, but also provide you real-life tools to pursue the creative journey you have always wanted. I'm your host, creative coach, and chicken wing lover, Shireen Kassab, a.k.a. The Funny Brown Girl. Yes, I have an unhealthy obsession with chicken wings. Now, get ready to flex your creative muscle. This week on The Creative Breakthrough, I had the opportunity to interview the New York Times bestselling author, Jasmine Darsnick, the author of Song of a Captive Bird, as well as the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Good Daughter, A Memoir of My Mother's Hidden Life. This interview was amazing. I mean, she dropped so much knowledge and information that was not only just useful if you wanted to be a writer, but if you were just a creative of color. Unfortunately, I could not fit it all in in this week's episode, so I'm dropping a bonus episode. In this episode, you can hear all the questions that I asked, mostly around her book, The Good Daughter, as well as Song of a Captive Bird, and her thought process when it comes to writing. Next week, I'm also going to ask her more questions about how do you write a novel and how do you make it a bestseller and get it on bookshelves. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask Jasmine, send them my way so that you can hear them next week. Email me at info at funnybrowngirl.com or slide into my DMs at Funny Brown Girl on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Enjoy this episode and I will see you next week. We start by talking about The Good Daughter, a memoir of my mother's hidden life. Jasmine is talking about how her mom came around to tell her story and allowed Jasmine to author this great book. And if you haven't read it, Definitely take a read. It is such a fast read, but so captivating and informative. Here we go. Wow, that's awesome that she came around. What do you what do you think made her decide to share it with the world? Because it's an it's a great story. It's really moving and touching, and it and it opens your eyes to a new part of Iran and the culture. Um, but I mean, the way it plays out in the beginning, you, you would think she like she kept so many secrets her whole life. Like, what do you think finally made her say, "I want to open up"? You know, I, I think just the pressure of keeping that secret must have been really extraordinary over the years. And then mm-hmm. I would say there might have been part of her that always wanted to tell the story. But like many first generation immigrants, she just she didn't have the language skills. She didn't have the knowledge. She wouldn't know how to present a manuscript. I mean, I don't even think she's she was thinking, you know, even initial first steps toward that. But there might have been some part of her. I think when she was a young woman, she did have faint stirrings of a literary ambition, but all of that got shelved, um, you know, partially from the experience of being a divorced woman in Iran Mm -hmm. and then, and then later coming to America and just having to work really hard. So she might've wanted to tell that story. And then, you know, she saw in me, um, you know, perhaps a, a, a medium through which the story could be told. Um, I think she also, at, 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 at one point, I think she told me that she said she was really surprised that Americans were interested, <laughs> you know? So I think, I think she was really you know, sort of ashamed for other Iranians to know, but she was really, really surprised that Americans might care about this. Um, and you know, for her things that, you know, things that would have been so shameful, there was a curiosity about it. And I think it, maybe it punctured some of that fear and hesitation, knowing that people might be interested in her story and not judge her in the way that the Mm -hmm. way that Iranians would. I've never been to Iran, but I mean, it's on my list of places to go. But the book between this book and then song, of a captive bird, you really get a, a vivid picture of what Iran is like and how what we see on the media is totally a different perspective. Yeah, it is and it isn't. I mean, it was important to me as I wrote both of those books not to flinch and not to um, not to look away or even sort of um, to sort of downplay the really harsh 
aspects of Iranian women's lives over the mm-hmm. last century, just the last century. So in my mom's case, having to give up this child, the horrible stigma of being a divorcee in, in Iran in the 1950s um, with Song of a Captive Bird, also so many struggles, so many challenges, so many overt um, overt acts of cruelty toward um in that case, the Iranian poet Furukh Baruch Zad. So I, it was important to me to let those be told, to to not sort of mm-hmm. whitewash that part of it, but at the same time to also emphasize how extraordinarily resourceful these women were. So in the face of these extreme challenges, cultural, religious, um, that they were able to really rally and in some cases create exceptional lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So that brings me to, to brings to an interesting point. Like the books seem very polar opposite. Like your first book is called The Good Daughter, and then your second <laughs> book it's like for Faro. How do you say her name? Faro. F- Furuk. It's almost like a K at the end. Furuk. Faruk. Okay. Yeah. She's like the total opposite of the Good Daughter, but, <laughs> but yet there was like a lot of similar themes. Like you said, like having a child really young, divorce, yeah. um, being a go getter, like wanting to have a career, but still polar opposite personalities. Like when you picked your second book, was was that something you considered? Huh, interesting. Well, the the good daughter of the first book is actually not me. It's it's this phrase my mom used to use to terrify me actually, <laughs> which is she used <laughs> no, to say I if you're all immigrants moms do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, she she used to say if you're not if you're not a good daughter, I'm mm-hmm. gonna I'm going to go back to Iran to my really to my truly good daughter, you know. So that it's it's always sort of it's it's symbolic, but it does not refer to me. And it was really a concept that I fought against, um, especially as I became a teenager and then as a young woman. That idea of goodness just did not sit well with me, you know. Um, but but yes, I do go in the second book in Song of a Captive Bird. I just go right to and at the life of this renegade. Uh, Furul was such a um, re- revolutionary figure in the Iran of her day, the 1950s, 1960s. She was writing poems about female sexuality. She was writing about, um, she was writing about politics. She was writing about environmentalism. And it was all very charged and very unapologetic. So I think for sure, like, you know, just thousands, millions, probably at this point of Iranian women, if we haven't necessarily always been able to live as freely as we want to, whatever that means, um, it has helped us to have these women like Furuk to hold up some idea of what might be possible for us. So I was always really attracted to her. And though my life, you know, it's never, it doesn't approach the kind of rebelliousness that um that she lived out in her life it it's been very useful to me to know she existed and to know the kind of boundaries that she broke down it's helped me be a little braver in my own life Mm -hmm. no i know well i had never heard of her and i thought it was an incredible story especially for that time like oh even, yeah i mean some of the scenes that you drew out just even like the having an affair i was like oh we we were doing that okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean it was really talk it, in our it, culture it's like taboo it's like oh my god sex is taboo like even in 2018 so i just couldn't imagine like back then it was yeah like, back then i mean that's really that was where even though she wrote on a lot of controversial topics it seems that that topic in particular really really got people talking it got people hating her it got people some some smaller number it got them really excited because it was such a um, bid for independence I mean maybe the most radical bid a woman of that time could make to uh, to be fully in ownership of that part of herself um, and uh, and I and I would agree it's still such it's I would say, in my life, even growing up in America, all those taboos about sexuality were definitely present. Um, they were they were very very difficult and and often painful for me to reckon with. And um, and so yeah, to think about a woman writing about this these topics at that time 
was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you were writing, like when you wrote your first book, The Good Daughter, your mom was there to kind of keep you on track. But when you're writing about Farouk, like how do you know how far, how much freedom or liberty do you have when you're writing about somebody else? Right. Because this is, it's a historical character, but I'm writing a novel. I did have certain rules for myself. So I, I didn't depart from anything I knew to be true. So if I encountered a fact that was, let's say that she, she got married in this year or that she had written in a letter that she felt stifled in her marriage, you know, I wouldn't have gone against the grain of a, of a truth of that kind, but I left a lot of room open for interpretation. So the book doesn't aspire to be a biography. It, it's very, you know, very clearly it's a novel. It, it doesn't prepen- pretend to tell the whole truth, but because Fudu is still so iconic, it felt important to preserve the basic truths about her life. So thankfully, her life was so dramatic that I really, if anything, I had to downplay or you know, sort of choose because there were so many dramatic episodes in her life. She gets married really young. She has to give up a child. She's, um, she's having an affair. She's uh, having another affair. You know, there, there was so much drama in there that... Um, I didn't have to work hard to make make that up. Um, the the more what was perhaps more difficult than sort of where is the boundary? It was um, trying to create an authentic experience because I wanted you to feel like as as much as you could, like you were hearing her voice, that you were spending time with her, and that's of course a simulation. I mean, I I could only only sort of guess what she sounded like. And I'm using the available materials like her poems and interviews she did, but to create a sense when you sit down with the book, that this was a, this is a real woman with a real woman's uh, conflicts and aspirations and all that. So that was hard. And, um, and that, that, that made me work. <laughs> Yeah, because that must have taken you a, a long time to research all that information. And at a certain point, you have to stop researching. Mm-hmm. I knew when I was almost done with the book, I learned of a biography that was coming out. This is the first, you know, really extensive biography ever to be published about her. And I could have chosen it. It was not published then, um, and it still hasn't been published in English. And I could have stopped and said, you know, well, I really need to read that. But I chose since I was I was really close to finished. I I stood by what I had created, and I and I decided to go th- go forward and and to let this be my version of her story. Mm-hmm. So, what were the? I wanted to ask you, even with the good daughter and and then the second book, like what were the people of Iran's like Iranians people's reaction, or even your mom's reaction to these books? To the to um, to my memoir to Song of a Captive Bird, um, you know it's interesting. I really, I particularly with the first book, I was almost almost exclusively. I mean, I had a I, I would encounter a handful of Iranian readers. Um, it was really not often that I'd encounter an Iranian reader. Um, there were some, and I was always I was always really really grateful when they would tell me. Oh, you you know you really got that time in Iran, or I feel like you captured something that I can now give to my daughter or my son to explain something about myself and where I can't come from. And so that that was really always wonderful to hear from an Iranian that that my story felt authentic and true and of a piece with their experience. Um, Song of the Captive Bird, I've encountered more Iranians. And I think it's because Furur is so iconic that, Mm -hmm. that, you know, people, when I was working on the book and I I tell people Iranians that I was writing a book about her, I mean, immediately there's a a lot of interest, you know, there's, it's sort of like writing about, um, you know, struggling a little for who would be sort of, you know, a similar person but I mean someone like Marilyn Monroe or you know she was just so terrifically iconic 
And there's a lot of mystery around how she lived and also how she died. So people were really curious. Uh, Americans I talked to were interested, but they didn't come to it with all of this sort of, you know, they they didn't know really all that much. It was just sort of, oh, this I, I can't believe this kind of woman ever existed. Um, and I was in, I think the best thing I've heard from an Iranian reader is I was in Berkeley a few weeks ago and an Iranian man came up to me and he said, I was really nervous about reading your book because I thought, I thought it might disrupt or compromise my furur. So he he was worried that I might tell her story in a way that didn't feel true to his understanding of who she was and how she rode and um, how she had died. And he said, I was really grateful to, to find out, having read the book, that your version added to my experience of her it didn't detract from it in fact it sort of added another layer of understanding and I thought okay my work here is done <laughs> you know so 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 to take someone you know who had, had he had a lot he 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 was he's he's such a devoted fan of hers probably knows all of her poems by heart he actually had told me that when he was courting his wife his American his first gift to his wife was a book of poems by Furu. So he was a really, he was a real fan, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and, and this, this could have gone really badly. You know? mm-hmm. So, so it's really fantastic uh, to hear that. And then, um, and I, and, and I, I really have, of course, you know, every once in a while you'll hear the odd thing. It's, it is often sort of the older generation that I feel like, they get a little, they have a little bit of a sense of ownership about this is, you know, who are you to tell our story, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so, so I'll maybe catch a whiff of that every once in a while, you know, um, but, uh, but that was the case even with my first book. Mm-hmm. It was, it was a little bit like, well, you grew up in America. I mean, how, like how, how much really could you know, you know, how, how authentic really are you, you know? So yeah. Well, I guess I was I was asking like the Iranian impact to I guess to the good daughter cuz I know um uh like your mom was nervous to tell the story and embarrassed a little bit and didn't want to share all the stuff that happened and I know um not I know. I read one of your other essays, The Summer I Disappeared where you kind of talk about Oh moving yeah. to LA cuz you lost your virginity and your mom got upset and you <laughs> mentioned um in that essay that you didn't talk about that in The Good Daughter and the towards the end, because you were worried about how Americans would react negatively to the abuse. Um, so I guess I was curious, just like, one, how did the Americans, or not Americans, the Iranians kind of react to like, oh, you're sharing our secrets, but also mm-hmm. like, how does living in America impact you being able to now tell these stories? Mm-hmm. And do you mean with respect to telling my mom's secrets or my my own or both? Um, both, I think, because it's still very, I mean, we're still a very closed, well, I say we, like the yeah. Middle Eastern Iranian culture is still very closed off to talk about some of these things and showing a different perspective, especially living in America. Right. Well, I, so many people, when they read The Good Daughter or Iranians who heard about just the concept of it would say, oh, that happened to my aunt. I mean, this experience that was that she didn't tell anyone, it was actually an experience that many families had, maybe not if in their immediate family, this um you know, a story like my mom's, they knew somebody to whom this had happened, somebody who was divorced young, somebody who gave up their child. And there was a lot of, I think there was a lot of, uh, you know, I, I think empathy. I, I got a, I got a feeling like, oh yeah, that's something that I know. And, and I, and I saw how it destroyed this person's life or I could see the legacy of um, trauma that le- that left behind. Mm-hmm. Um so that the 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 readings were very generous in that way um about my own secrets you know as you mentioned the piece i wrote for Shondaland is a story i couldn't tell when i was writing the good daughter in part because the good daughter i really i think of as my mom's book and she had so much more control over that book mm-hmm. and 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 also i was just i wasn't ready i think you need to be ready my mom was ready i wasn't i wasn't fully ready to tell certain stories, um, 
certain stories. And part of it, as you mentioned, was this fear because now I'm writing at a time, it's after 9-11, where there's so much Islamophobia and there's so much sort of really galling representations of Middle Easterners and Muslims that I did worry about contributing to that or mm-hmm. affirming it in some way. So that essay is about losing my my virginity and being really very harshly punished. Um, but then again, you know, that story is... I had not seen anyone writing about that, you know, and maybe it's out there. I just didn't encounter it, but it was really interesting how many Iranian women reached out to me over social media or, um, you know, over Facebook. And there was a real feeling of, well, first of all, I can't, I can't believe you told that story, but also, oh my God, thank you. Because, Mm -hmm. You know, while I maybe I can't tell you exactly how it went down for me, it went down for me. (laughs) You know, I I know, I know, you know, I know what what this was. Mm -hmm. I had a version of it happen to me. Um, And there, there's another moment where I just feel like, okay, my work for the day here is done. You know, because I know for me that reading something like Roxane Gay's book Hunger, if you if you haven't encountered it, but Roxane Gay writes about sexual abuse. And I am so blown away by her bravery. And when I encounter work that's that close to the bone, that takes that kind of risk, um, that, that, that is that shameless in a sense. And I mean that with real respect, you know, she's gotten to this place where she's going to tell the story. And in some sense, I think you really have to be beyond the story to be telling the story. It doesn't own her. You feel like she can tell it because it does. Well, when you read work like that, I think it can really free you just in the act of reading it. You know, there's at the very least, I think you look at something like Roxanne Gay's hunger and you think, Oh my God, I'm so grateful that someone just put that down, you know, even if you're not rushing to the page to tell your story, mm-hmm. it just, it diffuses this shame and this secrecy that is so crippling. I mean, I, I would say particularly for women, um, issues of um, sexuality and abuse are so crippling. And to hear another woman tell a story or to read an account of abuse, um, is very empowering to the people who, who read it. Right. So how, as a writer, like, how do you get ready to share those stories? Like, is it just time or? (laughs) Yeah, it it is time. I mean, I do think you need to be ready, you know, that the stories might just, you know, that it, that was a story. In some ways it would have been, it would have made more sense to write it closer to when the good daughter came out. But actually I think that that story, um, the story of, losing my virginity is a story that indirectly I was able to tell because I was writing about Furuk. And when I, it, the opening sequence of song of a captive bird is a, it's a virginity exam. And my mom in Iran, she was actually a midwife and conducted many hundreds of virginity tests um, as a midwife in Iran. So I knew what happened in those rooms to those girls, you know, and So the opening of Song of a Captive Bird places a young girl in that situation. And it was a very hard scene to write. Very hard scene to write. But I think something about writing it, even though it was fictional, even if even though I was writing about an experience from 50, 60 years ago, it unlocked something. And a year or two on, so not immediately then, but but a year or two after I wrote that, that I was somehow able to come at my own story with more courage. So in this indirect way, I think writing the fiction first, let me tell the truth, finally. In Jasmine's book, Song of a Captive Bird, I was captivated by Farouk, the main character, who is a trailblazing woman poet in Iran in the 1950s. I mean, her story is incredible. Take a listen. 
Right. So you're learning from Farouk when she was told not to read her reviews. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, she was writing in a moment where there's, you know, it really, it was almost immaterial what she was writing. Mm-hmm. It, just the fact that she was writing and what she was writing about was so outrageous and appalling to people that it didn't matter how good it was or how much of herself she put in, you know, she was, so thankfully I don't encounter that kind of resistance, um, you know, or I don't mostly encounter that kind of response, but, um, but yes, it was really instructive to look at this woman who really went for it and she paid a huge price. I mean, it's, it's almost sort of unimaginable how much it took and what it took away from her to write what she did. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, when I was reading it, it was definitely, like I said, I think I was, I was shocked for the, for the time period that there was this woman, um, making these moves. Like she was like, a, she was like a straight boss person, like boss woman. And I'm just like, oh my goodness. I don't know if I could be friends with her. She would scare me. She's so like a progressive for her time. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Not, not just ahead of her time, but also mm-hmm. ours, you know, and she's not perfect. I mean, as women, who accomplish these extraordinary things, as is the case often, they're not necessarily, they're not nice, you know, mm-hmm. they're not, or they're not just nice. I mean, sometimes there's a real hard edge to those personalities because there's had to be. And I get a lot of, a lot of people will ask me, you know, do what do you, what was it in Furuk that made it possible for her? You know, of all the women, because a lot of women were dealing with these challenges, what made it possible? And I think, well, part of it is, I mean, she had a real, renegade personality i think even from when she was really little she Mm -hmm. was a rebel um but she also had so many forces against her her father was against her her family was against her the publishing industry was against her her husband is again you know and i think that that was her crucible and it made her stronger so that sort of that combination of some innate rebelliousness and fortitude and a willingness to be not nice right or play nice all the time and then um, a foe um, who, in a sense, um, sharpens all of that um, innate rebelliousness and and bravery. Yep, no, that's true. And I find that it's it's interesting. Like when I look at my parents who were immigrants to the U.S., like they had that same like renegade, like we have to be successful. We moved all the way here pers- attitude, and they have been super successful. And then I sometimes look at myself and I'm like, oh, you gave me everything I needed, so now I don't have that. <laughs> That kind of drive. Yeah. I, I mean, I see it in my son. I do think I really, you know, much of my life, I think I have tried really hard to fulfill my parents' expectations for me. And it hasn't always taken the form they, it, it often, in fact, hasn't taken the form that they would have chosen for me. But I do work really hard. And I do, um, I do, I mean, I, I'd say I'm even, I mean, I'm, I'm really very hard on myself, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's a little bit of that imposter syndrome. I think that has to do with coming from an immigrant background. I mean, I was not, I was not to the manor born or I was not to the pen born, you know, and I've been, I remember when I was at graduate school at Princeton and somebody at a, I don't know, at a mixer or cocktail party, something said, oh, and are your parents both academics? You know, and it was like, uh, you know, you, the, certain moments, just you'll never forget them. I remember just being so confused by that, you know, I mean, it was sort of, it was so, such a um, collision of worlds in that moment, you know, <laughs> because my mom didn't study beyond she was pulled out of school when Mm -hmm. she was in eighth grade, you Mm -hmm. know, and my father didn't go to university and they were both very bright, but they didn't have opportunity, you know? And, um, and so, I mean, I just, you know, now I think, what would that be like, you know, (laughs) to have parents who, you know, had had more opportunities, let's say, and maybe could, perhaps I wouldn't have done anything. You know, maybe I just wouldn't have done anything at all. Maybe it's been better for me that I've had this foe. I've had this sort of opposition. I've had, I've had this life that really has made me work for the life I have. Right. 
So when you when you decided to go for your PhD, then what was your dream? Like, what were you? What was the goal? I think vaguely, I wanted to be an academic. I loved school. That's where I always felt sort of my happiest. I loved I loved to read, um, and I was pretty much on track to. I did a PhD in English literature, and I was pretty much on track to be a professor of English. And I published The Good Daughter, which I I mentioned I was writing in tandem with my dissertation. And that put me on a different track because then I was able to, I did teach at a small liberal arts college, and um, but I was able to teach both literature courses and creative writing courses. And and that was really fantastic because now I didn't have to just produce scholarly work. And I found actually, as I, the more scholarly writing I did, I found I really didn't enjoy it that much because it <laughs> felt, I mean, a, a lot of it, at least it just felt, this is how it felt to me is the, the project often feels like when you're writing literary scholarship is sort of to be smarter than the book, you know, or to, you know, cut the book you know, down to size, or, you know, there's this like sort of violence that happens in literary scholarship or, or even just sort of this, you know, I don't know, this arrogance that critics can sometimes have toward the very thing they are studying. It's very perverse. Uh, I did not like that. You know, I really, I really wanted to be in the place where I was lit up Mm -hmm. by what I was doing. You know, I didn't feel like my success depended on tearing you know, somebody, down, you know, sort of. So, um, so I, uh, you know, that I have ever since I've been teaching for 10 years and I, I do, I still do teach literature and creative writing, but I now almost exclusively publish creative work. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So what, what is your goal in your creative journey? <laughs> to keep going, you know, <laughs> you write the, the, you write the first book. I mean, it's just, it's a miracle just to write that first book. I mean, it, it's so, it's so hard and you're, you're, you're just again, you're up against, I think the worst obstacle is yourself. Um, you know, maybe especially if your family is like my family and doesn't encourage you or just outright is, is discouraging you. Um, so you write that book and, oh my God, it, it feels like a miracle. And then of course you're confronted with the sophomore effort, you know, well, what, what, what are you going to do next? Is mm-hmm. it, do you even have another story? You know, I mean, a lot of people say, you know, I have a, everyone has a book in them and that's probably true. I mean, does everybody have two books in them? <laughs> you know, and I wrote a memoir and I, some people, Mary Carr is the person who's coming to mind for me, have made careers writing memoir after memoir after memoir, you know, and each one is wonderful on its own. Um, but I didn't want to write memoir. I was pretty much done. I felt like I had suffered enough. (laughs) I had suffered enough. And the, um, you know, so, so the next project was in a, in a sense, it was a, it was a great project because it was sort of, it was a historical person and the outline of the story was known, but I had to make up certain parts of the story. So it was a great kind of bridge to, a straight up, straight up novel. And now, you know, I'm, I'm on my third book now. And I, I find I'm actually, I've left Iran. <laughs> so finally, I, I'm not writing about Iran. Um, you know, in part because, I mean, I, I love both books. They were really such amazing opportunities. Each of them was such a, it was just such a wonderful experience to write the two. Um, but it has been a little frustrating to feel like I'm seen as an Iranian writer and that, you know, I, I get it. I get a certain response every now and again. Sometimes it's more graceful. Sometimes it's more awkward, but an American reader will say, Oh, I didn't think I'd like your book, but I did, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, sort of. And, it, and it, sometimes it's sort of like, you know, I think, well, is that, I didn't think I could care about an Iranian person or a Muslim person. Is that what they're trying to say? Are they trying to say um, that I thought it would be too different or boring? You know, what, it, what does that mean? It really, it really vexes me and it, and it frustrates me a lot. You know, I mean, I think they mean well, I think they're trying to say you expanded my knowledge. <laughs> you sort of gave me something, but 
there's something about that that really upsets me, you know, to, to sort of have people be surprised that they like your work. You know, you sort of starting out with people either dismissing you, you know, out of hand because of the subject matter of your writing um, or their feeling surprised <laughs> that, that, that you're, you've told them a good story. You know, um, I don't think you're quote unquote, you know, you're, you're sort of your average kind of white writer deals with that. I, I just, I think that's, that's the normal. Right. And, um, and so um, I'm, I don't think I'll ever stop thinking about certain topics. I will always, will always be really, invested in in looking at women's lives and so forth but the novel I'm writing right now is set in America it's set in the 1920s it was a time of really horrific xenophobia and nativism and in many ways feels familiar <laughs> to this historical moment so that's an American story but it's also an immigrant story um and uh and I find that um, that some of the themes that I've been writing about carry o- cross over, but I'm kind of bent on showing myself and you know readers, I suppose that you know I can write an American story. I can tell you a story about us, <laughs> you know, because there's nothing really. I left Iran when I was five. It, if if I can do Iran, 1950. I think I can do San Francisco 1920. You know, there was really, it, I had to work really, really hard to to capture an Iran, you know, decades before I was born. Um, and uh, and so, so it's been really exciting. And I, and I'm, you know, I'm really happy that, um, you know, that I'm still writing, that I get to keep, keep writing um, and that I keep, you know, sort of finding new things to get excited or angry about. <laughs> As a uh, as a woman of color or writing a story that's not typical, what Americans want to read, like you mentioned earlier, did you face any str- challenges trying to find a agent or a publisher or just navigating your creative journey? I my agent is actually someone who uh, her name is Sandy Dykstra, and she represents a lot of. Um, women of color and immigrants and international writers. And I chose her for that reason. I wanted someone um, who was very invested in nurturing the careers of, um, of women writers, women, immigrant writers, women of color. So I was very lucky in, in making that connection. And we've been, you know, working together now for eight years. And I feel like if I chose, you know, if I chose to write another book or, about Iran, I think she would support me, but she's also being, she's also very supportive of the project that I was telling you about now. So that's fantastic that, that I feel like I have someone in my corner who doesn't see me as just Mm -hmm. an Iranian writer, you know, or sort of that's the brand that I'm expected now to feed into. And there you have it. The second part of the interview with Jasmine Darznick. Wasn't it great, y'all? I hope you got out of it what, as much as I got out of it. I think it was just great to hear the insights and the strategies behind how she wrote her books and where she came up with the inspiration and how she found the courage to tell her story. We're going to talk to Jasmine again this week. And on Thursday, we will launch a Q&A with Jasmine where she will talk to us about how do you even start penning a novel? How do you find an agent? How do you become a bestseller? So definitely tune in this week on Thursday when the episode drops with the third part of the series with Jasmine Darsnick, the Q&A part, I will call it the Q&A. So if you have any questions for Jasmine, send them my way, info at funnybrowngirl.com or slide into my DMs at funnybrowngirl on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. And there you have it, y'all. Now get out there and keep winning. Hey, before you hit pause, did you find this episode helpful and enjoyable? If so, could you leave an Apple podcast, a.k.a. iTunes review? It'll take you less than one minute and mean the world to me. The more ratings and reviews the show gets, the more people are able to find this podcast. If you're unsure how to leave a review, no worries. If you're on your iPhone or iPad, go to the homepage of this show and scroll down to write a review. Click on it and you'll be able to rate and review the show. If you're on a Mac from iTunes, go to the show homepage and on the top, click ratings and reviews. Also, please subscribe to get the latest episodes once they drop. 
If you enjoy the episode and know someone who would love it, please share. From your iPhone, click on the icon with three dots and then share via social media, email, or text. If you want to hear more, head over to funnybrowngirl.com forward slash podcast. You can also find me online. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Funny Brown Girl. Also, sign up for my free newsletter for more tips to advance your creative journey at funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. And again, if you enjoyed the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Now, go flex your creative muscle and keep winning. Thank you for listening. See you next week.